<laughs> Ron, open us in prayer, please. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for the people. Thank you for your, the knowledge. Um, it's always amazing to me how when I leave here, I always have learned something. And I just, you know, I really do enjoy it. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> well, here comes Joyce now. <laughs> so we... Um, Everybody knows, I think, maybe Mike doesn't know, but um, this will be our last Bible study until September. We're going to take off the month of August, so we'll have a summer vacation. Uh, what will you do on your summer vacation? Uh, I know the plans of some. I know uh, a, a particular couple that we are very fond of that's going to go in somewhat rough it but um they'll have air conditioning so it won't be too rough um but kathy would be living in front of the air conditioner i'm just saying so <laughs> at any rate because um, that's her preference and she doesn't like the heat and i get that uh so but um anyhow we will resume the first week in september um but uh, we will cover whatever ground we can cover tonight and so let's go ahead and get started we want to we're going to pick up where we left off, and uh, uh, sorry, there we go. Um, the the last question that we discussed, just to kind of, you know, how I like to do this. Let's get down a runway or taxi to the runway, and uh, why does John begin to weep in verse four? And we said that he did so because no one was able to open the seals and read the book. And having been promised by God to see what is to come, it's not, it now appears there is no one to provide him with the insights that he needs. And then thirdly, we said that John is experiencing the anguish of having a promise from God, which he fully believes to be true, yet based on circumstances, seems there is no way for it to come to pass. And if you have ever known that difficulty or that that experience let me put it that way that experience it it can be a daunting season to walk through and then lastly we said that no one in all creation at that time as with today will be able to see into what god's uh what is god's plan for the future of mankind except of course the unstoppable savior which is our next section and um, so, Joyce, can I get you to read for me Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, please? And one oh, wait a minute. Elders... I'm sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. Just read verse 5. And then, Jamie, if you could do 6 and 7. I'm sorry. I wanted to split it up. Go ahead. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Okay, Jamie. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four <clears throat> living creatures, and in the midst of the elder stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Okay, thank you. So, how does Jesus uniquely fit the description given here in verse 5? <clears throat> Jamie? Let, well, first... Yeah, let's... Just give us one, Jamie. Let's try to prime the pump and get others to chime in. But go ahead. I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, the, first, he says the line of the tribe of Judah. And okay. when the patriarch Jacob blessed his sons, he called his son Judah a lion's cub and predicted that the scepter would not depart from him in Genesis 49, 9 through 10. Okay. This, this prediction anticipated the arrival of descendant of judah who would rule as king okay that's excellent so the lion 
which was also the, the symbol of the tribe of Judah. And Jesus was descended from Judah through his mother. And if you, you could find that in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where the lineage of Jesus is given, and that through the perspective of his mother's heritage. So what else do we see there? How does Jesus uniquely fit the description given by the elder in verse 5? Norma, on mute, please. He was the line. He was the line of David. Or he was the root of David. He was the root of David. Okay, and I don't have the backup one. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right, Kathy. Um, can we um go back to that to, to the lion one about the lineage through his mom? Can I? I can I can go I talk it. on that for a second? I just thought it was really interesting because Judy Rohal, who was um. A Jewish uh, believer. Um, she she was a Jewish believer. She explained that why that's so important because in the Jewish faith you are what your mother is, and so even though her father was a Gentile, they were considered Jewish because it was the line comes through the hair, like through through the mother. Whatever your mother is, that is what you are. Yeah, Judy's just, mother. Judy's father was a Gentile. Yeah. Right. Judy's yeah. father was a Gentile. Yeah. And so and um, they always believed that no matter what happened, you know, if you're pregnant, they know for a fact that that child is yours, you know. So and I just thought that was always very in interesting. And so that is why um, they go through the lineage of Mary. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So I thought I'd share that. It, it shows the 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 jewish connection uh that it didn't matter what joseph was correct because he really wasn't the father but the the her um yeah that's good i thought that was neat so okay dale what were you gonna say uh he's the lamb which is oh, no, wait wait uh, wait don't not not yet sorry i thought you're gonna comment on the lion and we we stepped away from hold that thought um let's uh come back to the root of david uh norma had pointed out he's the root of david what what is meant by the root of david how should we understand that jamie um that was the source of king david's power and his kingdom okay but how is jesus the root of david if he was descended from david dale well yes, the, we it's it is spoke of as he's the seed of david and then the seed is germinated and then became the root so he's heir to the throne yeah he's heir to the throne yeah but how is he how is he the root is what thing what the tree comes from right. so the tree is the descendant of the root so to speak mm -hmm. so how did how did david how did jesus qualify as he's a descendant from david so mm -hmm. how is he the root from god surely surely um would it be because he's the, uh, David was the root, uh, it came from Jess, his father, the root, the root of David. And well, since there, in Isaiah, and all that days there should be a root of Jess who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. Okay, well, that, that's a description of who Jesus is, but it doesn't explain how this descendant of David is the root. Jamie? Well, Jesus and God are one and the same. So God was before David, and okay. the Trinity includes Jesus with God and the Holy Spirit. So he was before David, although he might not have been placed on earth before David. 
Okay. And that's exactly what I was looking for. Go ahead, Dale. I have two scripture references. Second Samuel 7, 16 and Isaiah 11, 1. And these, but they, they show the messianic connection with uh, David and the Davidic covenant. Okay. How does that show him to be uh, how well, Jesus is the root? Well, I guess we read Second Samuel seven sixteen <sighs> and Isaiah eleven one. <laughs> well, to see you know in context. That I think those are going to to point to Jesus as being the descendant of David, but. Uh, Jamie's explanation about him being the root, um, to me, that's really the point of it. Uh, John 1, 3 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And it, it also says that everything came into being through him. So Jesus is the one that created everything that led up to David. So that's how he is the root of David. He He is the the origination, the origination of, of David. He's the origination of all things because he is the creator. And so that's how he can be the descendant of David and still be the root. Dale? Isaiah uh, 11, 1. And there shall come forth a, uh, a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Yeah, and there again, that's, but the, the branch, of course, would be Jesus, and that's showing how he was rooted in Jesse and rooted in David. But in reality, David found his root in Jesus, and it, it's, it, it seems kind of backwards, but it, it's not at all because he is the creator, and he brought everything into being that, is, that, that exists, and that, of, of course, would include uh, David, who uh, was not, you know, first created, obviously, that was Adam. But uh, so what else do we see here that, that how Jesus uniquely fits the description given by the elder in verse five? We're focusing on verse five at this point. Jamie, go ahead. Well, it was predicted too. the uh, wise men told King Herod that Bethlehem in the land of Judah had been prophesied to be the birthplace of the ruler who would shepherd Israel uh, in uh, Micah 5.2. Um, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old and from ancient, ancient times. Okay, that would be additional support for him being from the tribe of Judah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so absolutely. Somebody else? What, how else does Jesus uniquely fit the description given by the elder in verse five? Anybody? Joyce, you got something over there? Now, the ones I have done, we've already talked about. Brought already up. talked about. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Dale. Well, I, I had said the lamb, but uh, I didn't give the reference. Isaiah 53, uh, 7, and John 1, 29. Well, the, but the lamb is not mentioned in verse 5 yet, and that's why I kind of put the brakes on it. We'll get there. So stick around with that. Oh, I, I'm sorry. My thing that's says right. the, that's 5 right. through 7. So. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, we're covering that whole section, but we're just focusing on verse five right now. Jamie, go ahead. Okay, are you referring to the has prevailed part of that? No, I, I think I probably ought to just go ahead and, and tell you what else I was looking at here was that being, being the creator himself he is then not part of the creation, which would have been searched, which was searched for one who could open the book. So Jesus uniquely, he could not be found in all of creation because he's not part of creation. He is a very creator. And so that makes him uniquely qualified. 
to fit the criteria here um, expressed in verse five. And then having been born of a woman, he alone has overcome all temptations to sin stated in verse five. So is the qualified to open the scroll. No other man had ever been born. No other individual had ever been born that overcame all temptation except Jesus. And okay. so that that fits as well, too. Mike, what were you going to say? Uh, in my commentary here, it says Jesus Christ is the only living Jew that can prove that can prove his kingship through genealogical records. Hmm. Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. So, yeah. And the passage I was looking to for the for the um, that last point was Hebrews 415 says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. So, you know, Jesus was tempted in ways that you and I can't imagine. Um, but whatever temptation you may have encountered in your life, you can rest assured that Jesus faced it and overcame it. And Amen. no one else that has ever lived can occupy that role or has occupied that role, or will occupy that role. So let's read uh, verses 6 and 7. Um, Joyce, would you read that for me, please? Oh, wait a minute. You, you just read, didn't you? I had you read 6 and 7. Yeah, but go ahead and read it again. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Okay, thank you. And that was my bad. We should have just read verse five the first time. But in what way does John's visual perception of Jesus in verse six, differ from what was told to him in verse five, Dale. Is it the lamb? Is that what, <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're trying to? Yeah. I think it, I think it's a squirrel, but I'll say Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, that was Isaiah. 53 7 and John 1 yeah but look at look at verses 5 and 6 do you see what I'm getting at there how does John's visual perception of Jesus in verse 6 differ from what was told to him in verse 5 and yeah Jamie go ahead hey, like when I look like this is left to our imagination because this doesn't come right out and say it but most likely when you hear the lion of the tribe of Judah like I would imagine a conquering king very strong very majestic like a lion not an animal that historically has been used as a sacrifice you know bloody and slain looking as in the lamb is what you're saying yeah 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 and that was exactly where i was headed i mean different verbiage but essentially the same thing in verse five the angel refers to jesus as a lion and that image is that of being a mighty, powerful, conquering, majestic beast. Now, you um, <coughs> recognize him as, as is speaking of a, of, a, of a king, but yeah, a predator. Yeah, uh, a, a, uh, a conquering, majestic beast. Uh, he's referred to as the king of the beasts. Yet in verse 6, John sees him as a defenseless, weak lamb. So... How does the description of a slaughtered lamb in verse 6 typify Jesus? Joyce? Well, that's exactly what he did for us. He was taking at the time of when they sacrificed the lamb at the temple, and was taking and crucified and put on the cross. Okay. Okay, Jamie? In the Old Testament times, when they sacrificed the lamb, it was unblemished. It was perfect. Um, mm -hmm. Lambs were used and sacrificed to atone for sins. 
but that was really foreshadow for Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice as the Lamb of God, and He was mm -hmm. perfect in every way. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Dale, go ahead. Uh, the scripture refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace, and we've seen it displayed in the Garden of Gethsemane when Peter pulled out his sword and locked up the ear of the uh, guard to where Jesus said, you know, he, he healed the, the, the guard's uh, ear and he demonstrated that he will not uh, exhort his, his, his power, but it, it will be done in a peaceful manner. So we see that the lamb is a symbol of peace to where, you know, um, you, you think of, of, of a lamb as uh, uh, a, a, a creature that, you know, is not uh, threatening. In, in it's docile. Manner. Yeah, I, yes. I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure that really is what we're, what is the most important aspect of seeing this, uh, what's here, Dale. I think seeing him as the slaughtered lamb um, is exactly what has been said already, that he was a sacrifice for sin. Um, you know, the, the, the lamb in the Old Testament was slain for sin, but Jesus became the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he was the ultimate sacrifice. He, he was the lamb. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how uh, the slaughtered lamb typifies him. Uh, yeah, he was um, he was a man of peace, but he's going to come as a conquering king, and we will see that as we get forward here in the, the book of Revelation. Yeah, Mike. Um, according to my commentary, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is used twenty eight times, I believe, in the in the, in the book of Revelation, and okay. the, the Greek word lamb means it's a a little pet lamb, a little pet lamb. That's the kind of lamb they're talking about. Here. Okay. Okay. A little lamb, not a full blown sheep. No, a little pet lamb. A little pet lamb. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So why is the lamb in verse six being standing a significant, uh, significant and how does it apply to Jesus? Ron. Well, everybody else was on their knees. Everybody else was bowing, and and so it's 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 a position of authority because he's not bowing like everybody else in the room is. Okay. No. Yes. That's certainly an aspect of it, Joyce. What were you going to say? I was going to say, you know, a, a slain lamb would be lying there, you know, bleeding out, <laughs> you know, but he rose. So he was standing there, even though he looked like a slain lamb, you know, because he was bruised and beaten and, you know, slain. But now up in heaven, he did, you know, rise. And so, you know, he's alive and well, and he is the lamb of God. Okay. Jamie, what were you going to say? As I say, while well, he was slain, he's still alive. He's still standing. He overcame death and he holds the keys to Hades. Also, yep. he wasn't bowed down in worship. He's the one worthy to be worshipped. Okay, that's good. Which ties the, the two together between what Ron said and what Joyce mm -hmm. had said. Yeah, but um, and really, I was looking more at it from, from the perspective that, that Joyce had uh, focused on, that only a living lamb would be standing. And this one is noted as being slain. The lamb was slain, yet he's standing. So it it uniquely applies to Jesus in that although he was put to death as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world for the sin of man, he, as has been stated, has risen again. So what is represented by the seven horns in verse six? What do horns represent? Jamie? Um, horns are scripture metaphor for power. And seven signify perfection. Okay. Those are both true. Horns represent power or authority. 
and seven is the number representing perfection or completion. So how do those, what do those then communicate about Jesus here? Anybody? It and seems to me that it's the ultimate power. Yeah. Well, what was that? I think Joy said something and Jamie said something at the same time. I think we said the same thing. I was saying he has all power, you know, nice. and he did complete everything and anything that needs to be completed. <laughs> yeah. He has all power in his yeah. words. Yeah. yeah. And good, Jamie. Are we, ultimate. Are we... He has the ultimate power. The ultimate power. Yeah. So these these seven horns indicate that Jesus complete or perfect authority and uh, familiar passage for you Matthew 28:18 says Jesus came up and spoke to the disciples this is just before he ascended he said all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth Jesus didn't get some authority he didn't get second chair he <laughs> has all authority has been given to him. Amen. Um, and so there is no authority greater than him. And as such, that's why, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. As we discuss, Kathy, go ahead. Couldn't find my thing there. I, is that like, um, does that have anything to do with the shofar, you know, that they blow? Is that what the horn is? Is it like some sort of announcement, you know? Um, um, I don't think in this context. I think in this context, it's talking about a horn, like a horn growing out of the... Oh, okay. I'm thinking because, Yeah, I was just thinking because it's a ram's horn, you know? Okay. So I was just sort of wondering if it had any any... If the shofar had any significance here, yeah, yeah. If I it wouldn't was, know as our as our resident expert on Hebrew. <laughs> you have if somebody. I'm the expert, we're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm saying. No, I was just sort of curious. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you discover something, you know, just I will. Uh, I'll check. Yeah, yeah, bring it on out there. Yeah. So, as we've discussed several times in this study, what are the seven eyes? which are the seven spirits of God that are mentioned in verse six. We literally just talked about this to the point that when I saw it in my notes, I went, this is too repetitive. People are going to get bored with this point. Anybody? What do the seven spirits of God represent? Didn't, Surely. Uh, didn't we say the Holy Spirit in his completeness Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> give, give the woman a cupid doll. Yeah. yeah, the seven spirits of God, we said, figuratively represent the Holy Spirit. And what, what do the seven eyes indicate? Anybody? <laughs> Kathy's gone off to dig into her Hebrew book. Anybody remember what the seven eyes communicate? All right, let's try to back into it. What is the number seven? Perfection. What does that communicate? With perfection. Perfection. And what the eyes communicate? Mm -hmm. What does an eye do? It's 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 yeah, Jamie, go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I had like uh, the spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding. Like I had so many notes written down by this thing. Uh, uh, not about this thing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, from different commentaries and there are widely differing opinions. about Which is, which is why you need to, to, to yeah. be selective of your commentaries. And, and I'm not, you know, it's good to dig into different ones, but you need to be aware of what their, their th theological perspective is uh, as as you look at them and make sure you compare it with the text itself, which, of course, you do. Um, mm -hmm. what, what what do eyes speak of? What does an eye do? It sees. It sees, yeah. So it's then perfect. what? Uh, Mike, go ahead. Oh, it's all out. seeing. God is all seeing. He sees everything. 
Oh, thank He's you. Very omnipresence, much, Mike. Yeah, um, omnipotent, everything. So, well, and the, well, attribute, all, uh, the attributes of God. So, yeah. And, well, and one of the three, uh, omnipotent means all powerful, um, omnipresent means he's everywhere all the time at all at all at all times omniscience yeah. is the one that is really reflected no pun intended by these uh, the seven eyes because the seven represents the perfection eyes represent sight so it means he sees perfectly so it oh. refers to his complete and full knowledge of all there is to know. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, there are no surprises to God. He nope. sees it all. He knows it all. He knows that boneheaded move you're going to make, and he's going to know that wonderful thing that you do. So the, the seven eyes reveal his omniscience, and the seven spirits uh, represent the spirit of God. Ron? Why not just say it? Why? Why so this is what frustrates me sometimes with the Bible. Okay. Like, instead of writing about horns and se seven horns and seven eyes, why not just say omniscient? Can anybody explain that? They might not have had that word back then. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they might not have that word. I don't know. We're going to see this down through the book of Revelation quite a bit. Yeah, and and I just I've I, but I've always wondered that I've always said you know why not just why well, does it just it's it's a vision too and I would think visions are more symbolic like even if we have a dream sometimes yeah. you have to like analyze the dream like you know there might be water pouring over a tub maybe that signifies you're having a real hard time with something <laughs> you know Dale. Whenever we're in service and, and the gifts of the spirit are in operation, the, the person that is speaking what God is saying to him doesn't necessarily have the interpretation, although may interpret. So what it is, is John is giving the vision and it is uh, up to us, the reader, to um, understand it. discover the interpretation I, I think that's a piece of it um but and and john may or may not have understood what was being communicated to him but the other what is is there something else here that we need to be aware of as to why symbols are used and why these Things are communicated the way they are. John is seeing things that are heavenly. That they're, he's trying to describe what he's being led to understand in this vision in terms that everyone can understand it. And so the symbols, these things might not speak clearly culturally to us today but imagine trying to articulate yeah I, I, imagine if you would have showed up with your laptop at the at um at 7 a.d and you showed up with a laptop and you were accessing all of this information on the it would be something that would be exceedingly difficult for them to understand. And I know that's, that falls way short of the point I'm trying to make. But the things of heaven aren't always... Mm -hmm. Things of earth. Yeah. I'm sorry? I get what you're saying. No. Yeah. Make, make... yeah it, 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 he, he... John saw these things and really couldn't fully comprehend them. And not only could he not fully comprehend them, but then he was trying to communicate them in a way that the people he was communicating to would understand it. It would be like if you see some magnificent structure or some beautiful event 
And then you've got to come home and try to communicate it to your spouse is tough enough. Try to communicate it to your children or your grandchildren and take it from that level and that experience and bring it over here and communicate it in a way that they understand it. Does that help, Ron? Okay. So, uh, but the symbolism and it's, one of the things I want to be cautious about here is to make sure that we understand that the discoveries that we're making about the symbolism are not subject to personal opinion or personal assessment. I mean, these are the, the fact that historically horns represented authority and power help to communicate what that is showing. Uh, a lion being a powerful animal, you know, it, it, it communicates that power and that, and, you know, so um, while John is trying to communicate things and I'm trying to communicate something here, um, it's sometimes it's a challenge to do that, but there's still only one meaning to it. Like I said on Sunday, oftentimes in scripture, we see multiple fulfillments of a specific prophecy, but that prophecy really only has one meaning. And it's the same thing here. Does that, does that all make sense? Does that clarify or muddy? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so what does the lamb having these seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, imply in verse six? Jamie. It represents that the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit's perfect vision of all that transpires on earth. Okay. How does that connect with Jesus having these seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God? He sees and knows everything. Okay. The, the lamb, what this indicates is that the lamb is completely filled with and controlled by the spirit of God. This, this is not just an ordinary lamb. Jesus was not just an ordinary human being. He was indwelt by the power of the Spirit of God. And here, in John's vision and revelation, that reality is manifest as John tries to communicate that this individual, this lamb standing there, is actually God himself, the Holy Spirit, manifest, who has this divine omniscience that everyone, that that only he, God, has. So the deity of Christ and the indwelling of the Spirit of God, the two being one there, is, is evidenced by this statement. In John chapter 1, verses 32 through 33, it says, John the Baptist testified, saying, I've seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained with him, and I did not recognize him, but he who sent him to baptize me said to me, he is he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So this is where uh, from uh, uh, Jesus incarnation standpoint, this is where Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And here in the book of Revelation, we see that John recognizes the Holy Spirit of God is dwelling in this lamb, who, of course, is Jesus. So um, these things. Uh, tie together here in that manner. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, comments? So what occurs when this unstoppable Savior steps forward to open the unapproachable book, taking it from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne? What does he provoke in doing so? Jamie? Well, first I put, not quite sure what you're looking for without going <laughs> further in the verses. Go ahead. But I put, um, he's able to take it, signifying that he's the one and that he is worthy. Okay. Joyce, you snickered. What, 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 
I was snickering what she said about you, Pastor. <laughs> was, she didn't know what you were looking for. I'm yeah. always as clear I as mud. I know what you're looking for. <laughs> but anyways, my answer is um, it provoked a response, like what should be provoked of us, you know, to bow down and worship him because he is worthy because of what he did. You guys are going to kick yourselves. Seriously. <laughs> you're making it too hard. It really is just a squirrel. Um, the answer literally is right in front of you. He provokes unrestrained worship, which is the very next point, talking about unrestrained worship. Um, well, so, because when we give you simple answers, it's always something way more that you're looking for, Pastor. That's why we always go with the harder one first. <laughs> <laughs> We're on to you, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, we got this. <laughs> Good. Well, I don't know. You missed that one. Go ahead, Jamie. What were you going to say? Well, although you did describe it. Well, you, you... coming up in this next <laughs> section, because... You know, oftentimes you say, don't get ahead of yourself. So I'll look right. at the next question to figure out where I'm supposed to stop. And then I started getting frustrated because a couple of them, I'm like, I think they're asking the same thing. So I just <clears throat> need to put this down for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> and sometimes it is asking the same thing from a different perspective. Yeah. But the hope is that there's a fuller understanding that comes out of it. So okay because i'm just thinking like okay if i get the first one wrong then the next two are wrong which means i now have a c average no. <laughs> <laughs> and we know that will never do that one uh, you know when, when i was at bible college they had to, they had this place where they posted their grades you know they called it the wailing wall because that's where you would go to see your grade and there was much wailing and gnashing of teeth at that wall well by God's grace, I had a really strong GPA, and I was one of the guys that tended to blow up the curve. So when I went to the whaling wall, I made some people unhappy because of the grade I got, you know. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so Jamie, I get it. I never it's wanted still, to be a bureaucracy. You know, in college, I, I, I came this close to failing one class, and it was because I copped an attitude about the, the, the miserable teacher that had it. And, um, yeah, oh, he was, he was terrible. It was a terrible instructor, terrible. And and not to get too far afoot, he actually lied to us. He straight up lied to us. And this is a Christian professor in a Christian college. He told us, throw away the, throw away the workbook. We won't ever use it. Every question and every test came out of that workbook. So mm -hmm. that's why I almost failed that one. But at any rate. Okay, unrestrained worship. Uh, where do we leave off? Dale, did you read yet? Not yet. Okay, would you read verses eight and nine, please? And when he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and 20 elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps of golden vials full of odors, which were the prayers of the saints. And they s sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, uh, which was of, of which was slain, and has redeemed us to God by his thy blood out of every kindred tongue and people and nation okay Amen. thank you so oh i'm sorry I'm, I'm reading my bible and saying why my notes that don't make any sense how would you classify or categorize the four living creatures and the 24 elders identified in the first part of verse eight. How would you classify or categorize the four living creatures and the 24 elders, Jamie? 
um, they're elevating Jesus and bowing. We come to understand the truth of our limitations and our power, sometimes our knowledge. And it's a little bit different than like bowing in the world today, which is more submissive. Does that make sense? No, obviously not by the look on your face. <laughs> I, I think I see what you're saying. Yeah. But to say they're acknowledging. Well, don't look at their actions yet. Knowledge. Yeah, don't look at their actions yet. I'm looking at them as a group. What do they, how would you classify them? How would you categorize them? Categorize would have been a better word, but I wasn't going to change it after I issued the, the notes already. Mm -hmm. How would you categorize them? How are you taking the school? The four living The preachers. 24 elders. And the four, living creatures. For the, the, the four living creatures and the 24 elders look at them as the characteristics of what they are and who they are. Joyous. I, didn't we talk once before about the 24 and we thought they were the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes? Yeah, of. I, and, and again, I'm not trying to identify them specifically. Here's what I'm looking at. These are the greatest representatives, representatives of the greatest of yeah. all the creatures in heaven and on earth. The 24 elders were representative of the greatest creatures on the earth. And the, 20, and the four living creatures were representative of the greatest of, uh, in heaven and all of creation. If you remember the description of the 24 uh, or, or the four living creatures. So in my mind, these two groups would be classified as or categorized as the greatest of all of the creatures in heaven and on earth. Now, that leads us to the next question, which is what do their actions, Jamie, toward the one who took the book communicate or anybody else? But what do their actions communicate? Or who said that? Dale, worship, yeah. Worship. They bow before him. And Jamie, what was the point you were talking you were making about um, bowing the distinction? In today's society, when you bow before anyone, king, queen, it's submissive. You're submitting to them. Okay. Um, in this example, it was everyone's understanding of their, th them not having the power and the knowledge. It was ex owning up to our limitations, it, it, knowing that he was the perfect person. W would you not see this as submission? I think it was more than submission. I think you submit out of fear. And ah. I don't think that's what they were doing. They, okay. they were submitting because he was worthy and they were acknowledging okay. everything they weren't was him. Okay. And now I see the distinction you were making. You were seeing submission as, an, as a, a response out of fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... And if somebody else wants to chime in here, what was motivating their response? Jamie, you said that they were every, he was everything they were not. Somebody else? They worship, they bow before him. People worship a lot of things nowadays, mm -hmm. but are they really deserving of their worship? <laughs> yeah god alone is the one deserving of our worship and so yeah they recognize that he was everything they were not but to a magnitude i mean it, it's like case in point and this this illustration is going to pale but i'm going to try to use it anyways this past week our ceo sent out um, uh, an email to everybody. And I have great regard for our CEO. I think he's a, he's a very good leader. 
I have great respect for him. He's a young man, um, but I have great respect for him. And so it's been my habit and I'm not blowing my own horn or patting myself on the back. And I'm certainly not trying to, if I can use the term kiss up to the boss, it's not about that. And he knows that, but I sent him an email, just a little brief email, just expressing my appreciation for uh, I, first, it was a great accomplishment. They've, they've implemented uh, a once in a generation um, upgrade to the water system or renovation of the water system in the city of Pittsburgh. And they had just been awarded like $209 million through the state. And so I just sent him a note and I just said, congratulations and thanks again for your leadership is what I said to him. And he, he replied to me and just said, you don't know how much that means to me. Thank you so much. I wanted to reply to him, but I withheld my, my response. But in my mind, I was thinking, and I wanted to say to him, as a leader, I understand the value of that feedback. And because I too am a leader, but infinitely, <laughs> infinitely smaller than what he is leading. You understand what I'm saying? And so it's that kind of, it was the, the one they were bowing for was so far other than they were. He, they weren't just above him. I mean, Will is, is above me in his experience and in his level of authority and those who, whom he leads. But Jesus, the one they were bowing for was completely other. He is completely holy. And so um, as they bow before him, they're acknowledging that and they're worshiping him. So it's, it's not just a, an acknowledgement. It's not just a bowing. It, it's, it's a worship and a, a recognition that we owe everything that we are to him is really what they were doing. So does that make any sense? Does that track at all? Yeah, but let's, let's start out there too, that the work you do is much more important because you're saving people's souls that don't, well, uh, so, and, and I and I appreciate that, Jamie. I, yeah. I do. Uh, um, uh, and I, from a purely secular standpoint, okay, from okay. A, a purely numbers standpoint, okay, uh, the the he's dealing with uh, multi million dollar budget. You know, um, what was our last budget? Was it? I don't think it was a hundred thousand dollars, but so purely from a, uh, from, I understand what you're saying, Jamie, but so my, my illustration, but I, no, the point I get, is, but I don't want you selling yourself short. That was, you know? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, let's just move on before I get <laughs> deeper in trouble here. And I know I'm not in trouble. I get what you're saying, Jamie. I appreciate yeah. that. So based on the actions of these individuals in verse eight, what does that tell us about the one who took the book? I kind of think I let the cat out of the bag there. What does that tell us about the one who took the book based on their actions, Joyce? I see that answer on your face. For me. You're the only Joyce in the room. <laughs> I was thinking of something else. I wasn't even listening. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, About that but, pie you're going to make? And bring down to me? <laughs> but what I wrote is that to me, it showed that he is much greater than they because they bowed down and worshiped at him, even though he looked like this, you know, lamb that had been slain. Um, but, you know, he is way greater than them because he's their Lord and their king. You know, okay. he's ruler over all. Okay. That's good. Somebody else? What do their actions confirm? Okay. He, he doesn't need them to confirm it. But what is, that he's the one that's worthy. Dale? They recognize that he is Lord of Lord. Their actions speak as their, rec their recognition of, of his position. Yeah, and, and really what I was looking for specifically, and you're kind of, you're all kind of dancing around it, but saying the same, it confirms his deity, that yes. he is God. These 
beings, these greatest members of all of creation would bow before no one else. If Satan showed up, they wouldn't bow before him. If a great angel showed up, they wouldn't bow before him. If a great man showed up, they wouldn't bow before him. But they bowed before this one because he is God. If he were not God, these greatest creatures of heaven and earth would never worship him. So it confirms his deity and their actions being the greatest of all of creation. Uh, they bow before no one else. Um, and uh, I, in, in my head, I was racing to try to come up with an earthly illustration, but but I, I, I guess... Anything else is going to pale. It's going to it's going to fall short, and it could be misconstrued, going the wrong direction. So let's just go on. Question twenty two: Why, according to the first part of the song in verse nine, is this individual uniquely qualified to take this book? And what is the first part of verse nine? There, he says, "Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals." For you were slaughtered and purchased the blood of your people. Well, we're looking at, um, is that verse nine? Yeah, I guess it's not the first part of it. You were slaughtered and you purchased your people for God with your blood. Yeah, what does that communicate? To indicate that he was uniquely qualified to take this book. Oh, I'm gonna let you off the hook because he gave he his life. Us, yeah. What's that? Because he was slain and he redeemed us by his death. Yeah, yeah. He was the Lamb that took away the sin of the world. He gave his life to purchase people for God. He paid the price. So that all of these individuals, all of these people could gather together under, under God. And I, I don't want to get ahead of myself. While this may seem evident and elementary to you, who or what were the people purchased from, as stated in verse 9? What were they purchased from? Hades, the devil. The devil? Hades, death. Hades death. Norma. His blood. No, that's what he paid. Oh. What were they purchased from? What were what were we redeemed from? Or sin, sin and sin. death. Sin and death. Yeah. Really, that he redeemed original them. sin. Correct. He, he redeemed them from the curse and control of sin. Because of sin, of which we are all guilty, if we grew up as a choir, as, a, as an altar boy, and never left the Roman Catholic Church, we're still guilty of sin, original sin, like you spoke of, Ron. And apart from the blood of Jesus, that sin has control over us and it <clears throat> is an eternal curse upon us but jesus paid the price to redeem us from that sin and from that curse and from its control over us so okay mm -hmm. you know i, I don't want to go into the next question yet because yep. there's more to it than just a quick simple answer so we're gonna we'll wrap up at question 23 and we will pick up at question 24 in a few weeks. Enjoy your summer, uh, the, the month of August. Yeah, Dale, go ahead. I want to go back to the question that Ron had as to why the, the scripture doesn't come out and just say it. I, I believe that, you know, we're looking at Revelation and John was having an experience. I believe that the, the, the scripture allows us, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to have that same experience. 
And, and so it, it's not just by, uh, oh, this is the answer, that type of thing. I, I think that it's like uh, the, the, the scripture is to enable us to uh, have that, that experience. And, and I, know, uh, I, I know that Ron has experienced, you know, through Bible study and that, like, you know, epiphany upon ep epiphany. You know, and, and I believe that, that that's what's so rich about Revelation is it is a book of experience. So. Okay. He who has an ear, let him hear. Jesus talked in parables all the time to make people think, to make people remember it better. You know, instead of just pouring out scientific sentences. <laughs> well, and, and but on the other side of that is there are things that are communicated clearly and plainly throughout the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so uh, the and all of that is accurate and helpful. Um, but I think we've got to keep in mind that John is trying to communicate heavenly things from an earthly perspective. And that's really where the, the difficulty comes in. And um, so that he's trying to help others to understand. So he gave them and Jesus did it in parables. You know, he, he said the kingdom of God is like, and he went on and gave illustrations to try to help people to understand. And I think John is doing the same kind of a thing here. So, all right, everybody, we will see you Sunday morning. It's a Duncan party. I'm so looking forward to it. It's going to be a great, a great, great day. And um, so we will see you all Sunday. Okay. Good night, everyone. Have a great night. Bye-bye.